Hi, I'm Dr. Ever Matthews. I'm here today to talk to you about the cardiovascular system. This video is going to be a part one of a three-part series on that system. And so uh, the cardiovascular system works very, very closely with the pulmonary system, which is the system of the lungs. Um, and together, they are oftentimes called either cardiopulmonary or cardiorespiratory. Right? And so based on that, you should be able to guess that the cardiovascular system, one of its, well, a couple of its main jobs is to then get oxygen and CO2 around the body. So it's going to you help by uh, transporting the blood that contains oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and also by transporting the blood uh, away from the tissues that contains uh, high amounts of CO2 and waste products from the cells. So it's going to get the nutrients the, the cells need to the cells and then get the waste products away from the cells. A couple of the uh, lesser discussed uh, roles of the cardiovascular system is it helps to regulate body temperature. Right, so if you think about it, blood is very warm and blood is being pumped by the cardiovascular system around the body. So if you want to increase how much heat you're losing to the environment, you can simply dilate the blood vessels of the skin and supply more blood to the skin, and that's going to help in cooling the body. On the reverse side of things, if it's the environment's very cold and you want to conserve uh, heat, you can constrict those vessels of the skin, causing less blood to go the, uh, to the skin and losing less heat to the environment. So again, the cardiovascular system is very important for helping to control the body's temperature. Uh, the last major goal of the cardiovascular system we're going to talk about is in transporting the hormones. All right, so remember, hormones are those chemical messengers released by the endocrine system um, that get around the body and cause some sort of action by uh, different end organs around the body that receive them and react to them. All right, so without the cardiovascular system to transport them around, they could not do that. All right, so so again, these are the main goals of the cardiovascular system, All right? And it's going to accomplish these goals by adjusting itself in one or of two ways. Um, that's going to be either increasing cardiac output and or redistributing the blood flow that's coming out of the heart, All right? So by increasing cardiac output, I mean increasing how much blood's coming out of the heart. And by redistribution of blood flow, I mean constricting and dilating those vessels, kind of like what I mentioned a moment ago when it comes to the the blood flow to the skin when you're hot or cold. So you can change the, how much blood is going to one area of the body or another by just constricting those vessels or dilating those vessels. All right, so we can't talk about the cardiovascular system without talking a little bit at least about blood, all right, because blood is what the cardiovascular system does. It pumps blood around the body. All right, so blood is made up of a, a few different things or at least it has a few major components, one of those being plasma. Plasma is just just the liquid portion of the blood. It contains a lot of the ions, so think of sodium and potassium, um, also calcium, some others. It also contains a lot of proteins that help with things like uh, coagulation. So if you get a cut, the blood will uh, coagulate to prevent you from losing too much blood. Um, it Platelets, uh, the platelets are involved with this as well, and that, that is in the plasma. And then also remember we have hormones being uh, distributed around the body by the blood. That's going to be dissolved in the plasma typically. Um, the, so the blood is primarily made up of plasma as well. So over 50% of the blood is typically plasma. So if you look at this diagram here, this is essentially a diagram of a blood tube. So imagine if you went to the doctor, they put a needle in your arm, took a little bit of blood out, put it into this tube, and then they spun it in a centrifuge really, really fast to the point where the blood separated out into its different components. And that's essentially what we're looking at here. And that's exactly how we measure something called hem uh, hematocrit. All right, so hematocrit here, this bottom one, is just the percentage of your blood that is red blood cell. Um, so in this example is 45% is the hematocrit for this particular uh, diagram. All right, so again, 45% of the blood in this diagram is made up of red blood cells. You can see that the red blood cells go to the bottom because they are the heaviest, and the plasma went to the top because it's lighter. All right, so besides just the plasma in the red blood cells, uh, we have some other things. We have white blood cells, which are important for infection uh, control because they're part of your immune system. And those platelets that we talked about before, which is part of the plasma. All right, so uh, coming back for just a moment to the red blood cells, the main reason why our blood is so much uh, has so much red blood cells in it is because the red blood cells hold hemoglobin. 
Hemoglobin is the molecule that can grab onto oxygen and carry it around the body, uh, which is the main purpose of your blood, again, is to get oxygen around the body. The circulatory system, so now we're not so much talking about the heart, but we're talking about the blood vessels coming away or going to the heart. All right, so if we go in order here, so we start with the heart and at the end, it's not listed in the in the the list here but if you look at this diagram it starts with the heart and then ends with the heart all right so starting with the heart going to the arterial side of thing uh, side of things we have the arteries next so specifically we have conduit arteries which are the arteries that simply are a pipe that just allow blood to go through them um, so they don't really have a whole lot of uh, action to them again they're mostly just a pipe then we go to a the next smaller uh, vessel down is the arterioles the arterioles are also called the resistance vessels so when we get uh, later on in this series of lectures here we're going to talk about how the, the vessels of the body constrict and typically when we're talking about the vessels constricting and dilating it's the arterioles that we're talking about because these arterioles have a lot of uh, smooth muscle in them so they that's what gives them the ability to constrict or relax and dilate and they're also heavily innervated by sympathetic activity which is what is the signal to constrict all right so going now to the uh, next smaller uh, vessel type we have the capillaries the capillaries are the smallest of all the vessels they're also kind of the midway point between the arterial side and the venous side of things all right so capillaries are where all exchange takes place all right so exchange doesn't happen in the arteries or the arterioles it also doesn't happen in the next ones i'm going to talk about the venules or the veins all exchange in the body so when o2 or co2 goes in or out of the blood also, when nutrients or waste products go in or out of the blood, it's going to happen in the capillaries. All right, so the capillaries are these very, very small uh, microscopic vessels that are very, very leaky as well. So the blood uh, cells oftentimes have to go through them one cell at a time in a single file line because these vessels are so small. The next vessel in order, and now we're going up in size. So again, we went down in size to the capillaries, um, which is what's being depicted here by this narrowing. And now we're going up in size, ending eventually with the heart again. But the next one in line is the venules. The venules are just small veins. All right, so they, that's where the capillaries collect together and bring the blood going back towards the heart again. All right, so going to the last part of this before we get back to the heart we have the veins the veins are similar to the arteries except for instead of taking blood away from the heart the veins bring blood back to the heart um, they are, do have some other differences that we'll talk about veins are usually bigger they can hold a lot more blood um, they can constrict and dilate in order to uh, put more blood in the arterial side or have less blood in the arterial side but we'll get to all that later on all right, so if you look up in this top corner here, I, I do have a thumbnail for a YouTube video uh, on my channel for an echocardiogram of a heart. You'll be able to see the valves, which are here and here, opening and closing with the heartbeat. You'll also be able to see that the four chambers of the heart, which are represented by these four here in this diagram, and here's those two valves. Um, You'll see those chambers contracting and relaxing. You'll see the valves opening and closing with those contractions and relaxations. All right, so um, it's a nice way of seeing what it looks like in a more realistic, uh, real life situation. So again, this is the ultrasound of the heart. All right, so just to cover some of the major anatomy here, we have the atrium, so the right and the left atrium. The atriums are the receiving chamber of the heart. All right, so they receive blood from the body, the right atrium, and they receive blood from the lungs, the left atrium. We also have here the right and left ventricle. The ventricles are the pumping chambers of the heart. They're the chambers that actually pump blood away from the heart. Uh, on the right side, it pumps it to the lungs through this pulmonary artery. On the left side, it pumps it to the entire body through this aortic artery right here. All right, so some of the major vessels that I haven't mentioned so far, we have the superior and then inferior inferior vena cava. They are the major veins of the body that are going to bring, bring the blood back to the right atrium and so back to the heart. Um, we have the pulmonary artery with its split here going towards the right and left side of the, the chest to the right and left lung. 
we have the aortic uh, artery with the aortic arch and behind the heart here we have the descending aorta coming into eventually the abdominal aorta if it were to continue down this diagram all right so the major valves here we have the right and the left atrial ventricular valves um, those are the valves that separate the top and the bottom of the heart so that separates the atrial and the ventricular parts of the heart so that's why they're called an AV valve there's some other names to a lot of these valves so the bicuspid and the so the bicuspid and the tricuspid are common names for these as well and then we have the semilunar valves um, which are basically the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve. The job of a valve is to allow blood to flow in one direction and one direction only. All right, so notice that they're all kind of shaped like this. That means the blood can go through this way, but if it tries to go back the other way, the valves kind of stop each other and they don't allow the blood to go that way. So this is a one-way valve going downward, this is also a one-way valve going downward, and these are one-way valves going upward outside of the heart. All right, so some other things we have here, we have the papillary muscles, and we have uh, some of those on basically on both sides of the heart. Um, so those are there to grab onto the, the major valves inside the heart, separating the top and the bottom of the heart. So those are the chambers, the, the ventricles here, are the chambers where there's a lot of pressure that builds up and so these papillary muscles will actually contract uh, whenever the ventricles contract in order to prevent the valves from flipping the wrong way all right so it's just a another structural mechanism to make sure that the valves stay uh, the way they should be all right so i think that basically covers the majority of this we have some other things that you might hear sometime the interventricular septum and there's a some different uh, uh, names of some of these walls that we won't be covering here. All right, so let's go ahead and get to the flow of this blood though. So we basically have the same diagram, but now we have arrows all over it showing the direction of flow at every point where I think it was necessary to uh, sort of show that. Um, and so you can see if we separate it, we have a right side of the heart and a left side of the heart, like I mentioned before. The right side of the heart receives deoxygenated blood from the body, so from the muscles and the organs and all of that, back to the right side, and then it pumps that blood to the lungs. And inside the lungs, that blood is going to exchange out its CO2 and then bring in oxygen. And that, lung, uh, and that blood from the lungs is gonna get back to the left side of the heart where it is now oxygenated and get pumped back to the body to be uh, used up, uh, have the oxygen used up and it just sort of cycles in this way continuously. All right, so to go step by step, so we have the right side of the heart, the different order of, uh, of essentially areas of the heart where the blood's going through. So we have the right atrium, which is right here. We have the tricuspid valve, which is right here, which is again also called the right atrioventricular valve. We have the right ventricle, which is right here. We have the pulmonary valve, which is right here, which is also one of the semilunar valves. That's another name for it. And that goes into the pulmonary artery, uh, which splits again into the right and left pulmonary arteries. Um, then we get to the lungs, which aren't, isn't depicted here, but it is depicted right here. So here's your lungs. And back to the pulmonary veins, which are these red, these two red veins here and these two red veins there, going back to the left atrium. All right, so now we are on the left side of the heart. So we have oxygenated blood. Once we left the, uh, the lungs, these uh, pulmonary veins here are the first of where the, the blood is oxygenated. All right, so again, once we're in the left atrium, we're gonna go through the mitral valve, also called the uh, left atrioventricular valve, down to the left ventricle, which is going to pump blood through the aortic valve, also a semilunar valve, to the entire body through the aorta. All right, so that's essentially the list of things here. Um, 
I guess I can continue with this. It's going to go through to the body, get used up by the, the muscles, the oxygen will get used up and replaced with CO2 and go back into the inferior and superior vena cava here and here to go back into the right side of the heart and start this all over again. So that's the order of things. Again, you should know the anatomy and you should know the general order that all of this, uh, where the blood is going through the heart. So the path of the blood through the heart. If we were to take a chunk right here out of the, the side of the, of the heart and see what the wall of the heart looks like, that's essentially what we have here. All right, so inside the heart is where the blood is. On the outside of the heart, we have a lot of connective tissue. We have three Three different layers. So here are the three different layers of the heart. Um, the epicardium, which is this outermost layer, is basically just connective tissue. So it is a really tough tissue that's going to essentially hold the heart together, make sure that the heart doesn't sort of balloon up in an area and kind of explode like a balloon or anything like that. It holds it all in place. The next layer in is the myocardium. This is what we generally think of when we think of the heart. This is the muscle of the heart. So it's the thickest layer. It's the most active layer. This is where um, the uh, contraction of the heart is taking place is in the myocardium. The next layer down is the endocardium. It's this layer here. The endocardium are endothelial cells. So this is essentially like a skin-like tissue. Um, this endothelial layer is going to go throughout all the vessels of the body. All right, so it goes, uh, it goes from the endocardium in the heart through to the endothelium in the, in the blood vessels in the, within all the arteries, all the veins, you have this endothelium. So again, it's, it's kind of like a protective layer to prevent blood from leaking leaking out. It also has the ability to produce some um, different hormones and paracrine uh, uh, molecules that we won't be talking too much about here. Um, but it does have some other purposes other than just being sort of a, a waterproofer. All right, so this myocardium here requires a lot of blood flow because it's constantly contracting, right? So if it's constantly contracting, that means it needs a lot of aerobic metabolism. Aerobic metabolism requires oxygen, so it needs a lot of blood because that's where the oxygen comes from, All right? So the myocardium gets its oxygen supply through arteries called the coronary arteries, all right? The coronary arteries are just the name we give the arteries that feed the heart, all right? So a lot of blood's going through them, a lot of oxygen, a lot of nutrients to make sure the heart is constantly functioning. If you get a blockage inside one of these coronary arteries, that is a myocardial infarction. The lay term for this is a heart attack. All right, so if somebody gets an MI, myocardial infarction, heart attack, any, they're all the same thing. If somebody gets one of those, that's obviously a very serious situation. Um, and so uh, this can cause death of the myocardium, or at least in certain areas, and potentially, obviously, death of the, of the individual if it's a severe heart attack that isn't treated right away. So myocardial infarctions are a very bad thing, obviously. Um, so some good news, obviously exercise decreases your chance of having a heart attack. Um, if you get a heart attack, even though you exercise, um, so let's say you've spent your entire life exercising, but you just got bad luck, bad genetics, whatever, and you still have a heart attack. The good news is the damage to your heart is likely to be less than it would be in somebody who doesn't exercise. All right, so the heart has the ability to sort of train and get used to having a little bit of a oxygen strain, meaning like less oxygen than what it really wants around. And so it gets really efficient and good at handling those situations. And it doesn't mean that it can handle uh, a lack of oxygen for very long, but it can handle it better than somebody who doesn't exercise. So um, it, it's something called exercise preconditioning. Um, and so it's something that is one of the benefits of uh, cardiovascular exercise or cardiorespiratory exercise. In the middle layer of the heart is all muscle. So just to quickly look at the different types of muscle so we know what we're talking about, that is all cardiac muscle. So the myocardium is all cardiac muscle. All right, so the other types of muscles we have in the body are skeletal muscles, which we're not gonna talk a lot about in this section, but there is a, a video that I'll put a link to below on uh, skeletal muscle um, where we covered that. And there's also smooth muscle. So smooth muscle is important for the digestive tract, but it's also very important for the blood vessels of the body. So cardiac muscle and smooth muscle are the two important muscle types for this chapter set. The size of the cells uh, related to the different types of muscle uh, 
it's larger muscles for skeletal muscle, smaller, shorter muscles for cardiac, and very small uh, cells for smooth muscle. They have some differences in their shape as well. The uh, skeletal muscle is very orderly, very long and cylindrical. Um, you can see striations. Striations just another name for stripes essentially. So you can see these stripes made up of the actin and the myosin and the different uh, myofilaments. The cardiac muscle has some striations that are harder to see because they're, the, the cells are not as orderly. They branch a lot. You can see the the different branches here and then the smooth muscle is again very small it doesn't have striations because it's not nearly as organized um, and it's going to be spindle shaped which means it's going to be smaller on the two ends and sort of wider in the center all right some di other differences, the nuclei, all right, so we have multi-nucleated uh, cells for uh, the uh, skeletal muscle, which means there's more than one nucleus per cell. The other types of muscle are mononucleated. Um, the skeletal muscle is only used essentially when you want to use it, where the cardiac and the smooth muscle are constantly being used. Uh, cardiac muscle is uh, pretty forcefully used on a regular basis, and by regular I mean every second. Um, the smooth muscle is continuously used, but it's a very slow, sort of steady, um, weaker contraction. The control of these, um, the skeletal muscle is voluntary, the other two types are involuntary. It's going to happen whether you want it to or not. Uh, the initiation of the contraction is a little different. So when I'm talking about the initiation, I'm talking about calcium release. All right, so in skeletal muscle, calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In cardiac muscle, it's going to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, as well as uh, a lot of the calcium is going to be coming from sodium channels on the outside of the cell, letting sodium in, oh, sorry, letting calcium in from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And on smooth muscle, it's largely coming from the outside side of the cell and it's going to be working directly on the myosin rather than working on the tropomyosin and troponin molecules. So those are the different types of um, muscle in the body. Again, the two that we care about here are going to be smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and end this first section here. So that was basically a lot of anatomy and sort of basic uh, definitions and terms that you'll want to know about. All right, so uh, in the next section, we're gonna start getting into the uh, actual function of the heart, talking about cardiac output, heart rate, stroke volume, those sorts of things. If you have any questions um, or comments, you can put those in the comments section below. Um, otherwise, please come back and watch one of those other videos. Thanks.